Brethren, today I'm going to be sharing with you some things that are said about the saints of God. There's some key words here at the end of this passage I want to expound on. And it's good to know what the Lord says about His people. So the question is, He says, they that are with Him, that's with Jesus, that's how they're described, called, chosen, faithful. Well, are you with Christ? Well, then this is talking about you. This is a description that could be given to you. Now today, you do hear some things said about the people of God. The modern church says things about them. We hear they're no different than anyone else. This is what they say. They say that they try to do what's right, but they fall short continually. You'll hear that. We know they're not perfect. They, they, they exhaust that one quite a bit. Not perfect at all. But what does God say about the saints of God? That's really what I'm interested in here. In this passage, we see how the Lord views His people. He says, called, chosen, faithful. That's what the Lord says. Now, I'll expand on those three words. That's going to be the focus, that very end. They that are with Him. That's the focus of this main passage. And I will not do so in the order mentioned, mainly because I want to be precise. I mean, it says, called, chosen, faithful. But we want to be clear in that order that it doesn't say He calls you, then He chooses you, and then you're faithful. I don't think that that's what the that this passage is distorting that, but it's clear in Scripture that He chooses you, He calls you, and the result is you're faithful. And I want to make sure that we are clear on that just the same. Just a little background here, as you can see at the beginning here, there's people wanting to come out against the Lamb. You'll read here in a little, a little earlier, you read about some kings, you read about a beast, and it says they'll make war with the Lamb. Not saying there's going to be an actual struggle on Christ's part with these enemies, these foes, but that's just, it's going to be a very futile attempt. Because the very sixth, but the Lamb's just going to overcome them. It won't be a challenge for him. And it says why. Because he's Lord of Lord and Kings of Kings. He's the highest authority. He has more, he is greater in power and might than any other force on earth or in the heavenly kingdom. So this will not be a challenge. And as he is victorious, his people will also be victorious with him. It says that all who are born of God, they overcome the world. So as Christ overcomes, his people will overcome as well. I'll focus on that one part there. It says those that are with him, which means Christ's followers, they're where he's at. They're not at a distance from him. They're with him. And if you don't have that connection with the Son of God, then you're just not in this verse. Let's just be clear on that. Remember that if you're going to say that you're in Christ, you have to match the descriptions of those in Christ in the Scriptures. You have to. It says, called, f chosen, faithful. That's what it says. Well, also it says in 1 John, if any man says he abides in Christ, he must walk also as he walked. That's what it says. There has to be some evidence. If the scriptures say that those who are in Christ have been called out of darkness and into his marvelous light, then those in darkness better not be saying God called them. Because God does not call men into darkness or leave them in darkness. If God says that those who are chosen are noted for being a peculiar people, it's in 1 Peter 2 verse 9, chosen generation, peculiar people, then those who live no different than the heathen, um, living the same way, living as vile as everyone else, better not be saying they're one of God's elect, because that's not the description of the elect in Scripture. If God says His people are faithful, staying by His side at all times, heeding to His teachings, believing what He says, then adulterous people better not be saying they're His children. Our main text says this is what they are. Not what they ought to be. They are chosen. They are called. They are faithful. Amen. We'll start with that one there, chosen. Now, unfortunately, this is a subject many men are hesitant to speak about, mainly because of all the controversy men have made over it. And it's, a very, it's very sad that this is so. It really is. Because this is a wonderful subject. It tells us a lot about God's power, His sovereignty, His control, and purpose. And if taught correctly, it can create a great amount of confidence in believers' hearts. Other versions say select or choice or elected. So with, that, with those kind of words being used here, uh, there's no question as who's the one making the choice in this passage. I mean, as you read, it doesn't say those who are with them have chosen to be with them. It says they are chosen. Amen. This clearly refers to the choice that God has made. Other passages say God's chosen us in Christ. Or chosen us in Him, Ephesians 1.4. It also says that God's from the beginning has chosen us to salvation, 2 Thessalonians 2.13. And that we're a chosen generation. Again, in 1 Peter 2.9. So in all these cases, God's the one who does the choosing. The choice in reference is not one made according to merit. 
This is evident in the fact that they were chosen before the world was even made. In those two passages I just referenced, Joseph and him before the foundation of the world, from the beginning hath chosen you. This should make it clear that God had purpose in mind from the beginning. And the choice was not, therefore, made according to works, for the choice was made before any right or wrong was done, just like in the case of Jacob and Esau. While they're in the womb, boys had done no good or evil, God had made his choice then. Who was going to be used in his purpose? Jacob was the one that was selected. And to further confirm this, it should be obvious that God has not chosen us according to anything that we have done, if God chose according to merit, if that's true, you know, he might see some good in some person. He'll say, well, hey, they're qualified for what I'm going to do, so I'm going to pick them. If that's true, then surely Saul of Tarsus would never have become the Apostle Paul. Surely Moses would never have been the one to lead Israel out of Egypt, seeing that he was a man of uncircumcised lips and of a slow tongue and, sorry to speak crudely, herding sheep out in the middle of nowhere. Surely the disciples would never have been chosen, seeing they were just fishermen. And Israel would probably never have been chosen, seeing that they were the smallest of all the nations. See, in all these cases, God chose according to his purpose, not according to what men did. He chose men, and he gave those men the ability to do what he wanted them to do. See, Paul was a persecutor, but God made him an apostle to the Gentiles. God made him that. Someone who helped the saints rather than destroy them. Moses did not see himself qualified to lead, but God made him a leader. He did. The disciples were fishermen, but Christ made them fishers of men. Israel was a small nation, and God made it a blessed nation. So the same principle applies to our salvation. God did not choose you due to something you had done. I mean, if he did, then it's not by grace you're saved. It is according to your merit, and that's why I get so irritated when they bring up the foresight thing. God looked in the future and saw you would believe. That's, that's salvation by works. It is. That's something you're doing, moving God to save you. The fact is, the fact that there's none that are good, the scripture's the same, not all have sinned. That should make it plain to even the most novice Bible reader that we're not saved according to some good that we have done. God saved us because it was his purpose and good nature to do so. And his choice has to do with his purpose. Now the church of God is said to be like a building or God's husbandry. That's the first Corinthians 3 9. You're God's husbandry, God's building. Before a building or structure can be built, the builder must first choose a place to build his structure on. Before men start planting seeds and growing plants, they must first choose a field and then cultivate and prepare that field for gardening. Likewise, the Lord has from the beginning set apart the saints for a special work. And likewise, he's cultivating them, preparing them for that work. This is all planned off from the very start. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew he was going to do it in, what he was going to do with those people, what the outcome's going to be. That's already been determined from the beginning. And the scriptures say that he predestinated those whom he foreknew to be conformed to the image of his son. So we're not talking about like a small work. This is a big work God's called you into, chosen you for. And he's changing you from a lowly to a glorious creation in Christ Jesus. If nothing else, this shows us that no man takes credit for his salvation. Salvation is of the Lord, start to finish. If you're in Christ, it's because God put you there and he'd intended you to be there from the beginning. It's not an accident. You didn't stumble there. It's not something you can credit to yourself. The scriptures teach that it's by grace that you're saved, not of that of yourselves. It's the gift of God. And again, I want to emphasize this. It's with Christ that this, this is like the people that are with Christ, they're the ones that said to be chosen. Amen. The people that are living at a distance, they're not called this. Now, Jesus, this is in Mark 3... 14, I believe, it says Jesus ordained 12 men that they should be with him at all times. Go where he went, hear everything he said, never depart from him. And in a similar sense, God has chosen us to be with Christ, to be with him wherever he is forever. Hence, Christ prepares a place for us. That's the point. He chose you for this purpose. He's going to put you with Christ. He's joining you to his son. We can take joy in knowing that our salvation is no accident and that God is able to keep us from falling and perform the work that he's begun in us to the end. This is why we will be overcomers in the end, because God intended it to be that way. It says, he that endures to the end shall be saved. God will give you the ability to endure. Now there's this next thing here. It says those who are with Christ are called. Now God did choose us, but did he just like pick us up and just set us next to Christ like you move like a chess piece on a board? This is not so. God calls us 
unto, fel unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ. When you like consider a call, you may think like an invitation that's like sent out for a special event. Or perhaps you may think of a summons, like a court sends out to those who must appear and give an account for an offense or give a testimony. Or you may think of soldiers that are at base going about their business and are called to war with a trumpet blast. My point is a call is something that draws people. It's, it's something that demands a response also. You know, the call isn't like just whipping a re no rope around your neck and just pulling you in. He calls and then you enter in. That's the idea. God has chosen us, but at the same time, there is some kind of involvement required here. However, just like it is God who made the choice, you know, concerning your salvation, it's also God who makes the call. The scriptures say this is a holy calling, meaning it is one who draws or leads to holiness. It's also called a high calling, one that comes from above, one that draws us higher. It's also called a heavenly calling, showing that it's not one that had its origin on earth, but it comes from where the Father resides. Scriptures even say in 1 Peter 1.15 that he which hath called you is holy. Yeah. So it only makes sense that the calling itself is holy and the means by which the call is made, that's holy. Everything about it is right. So there's no question as to how we got where we are. God has led us to Jesus Christ. Yeah. He's led us with to where we're at. And there's other passages just to kind of browse a little bit. Some other things it said we're called to peace. It says we're called to glory and virtue. It says we're when it's speaking about enduring hardness as a soldier of Christ, as a soldier doesn't entangle himself with the affairs of his life, but he thinks of the one who called him to be a soldier. We're called to be soldiers too. And also it says we're called to liberty, called to freedom, freedom from sin and bondage. Now when considering that the saints have been called, I'm also thinking about how the saints have been separated from the world. Because that's like what a call, it's like drawing you away from something and into another place. Scriptures say that those who are in the world says to those who are in the world, come out from among them. Be ye separate. That's like a call right there. Come out. Maybe Lazarus in the tomb. He's not dead anymore. Come forth. Come out of the tomb. God does not want his people to be like those in the world, those who are evil and corrupt. God wants people that are holy and zealous of good works, which he does make us in Christ Jesus. Part of the process of salvation is drawing us out of the world and into Christ. And the scriptures do say he's called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light, as referenced earlier. Out of darkness. To be drawn out of darkness, that's like being drawn out of sin. It's being drawn out of ignorance. Drawn out of misery. And to be drawn into light is to be drawn to God himself, who is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Called into a place of peace. Called into a place of enlightenment. Called into a place where life can be obtained. So God may choose his people, but he doesn't just stop there. He does something with them. And one of the things he does is he, he calls them out. Calls them out of the world. Unto himself. This shows that those who are in Christ are not only intended to be with them, but God himself draws them to Christ. It wasn't like God just wanted it to happen and he just kind of like hoped it would all play out. No, he made it happen. He made it happen. The scriptures say that no man comes to the... Jesus said no man comes to him unless the Father first draws him. However, I will say on this note, I want to say something about the means by which we are called here. Because in the very next verse, that's John 6, 45, Jesus said that all who have heard and learned of the Father come to him. That's what he said in the next verse. And it shows us something about the means by which calls us to be with him. Some might feel they want like a calling like what Saul of Tarsus got. You know, Jesus just appears and says, follow me. Well, this isn't how it's going to happen. <laughs> With him, and with, with the Apostle Paul, that did happen, but this is not so with us. Something Paul did, did say does shed light on this. He told the Thessalonians that they were, they were called by his gospel. That's, right. Amen. that's like the very next verse when he says that God's from the beginning. He's chosen you into salvation. And in the very next verse he says, he's called you by our gospel. The gospel that, that has been revealed to us. Likewise, this is like the means by which God has called us. It's through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen which is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. As we've heard the word preached, is the author of salvation. It's, it's of him in every sense. Now this last thing here, it says that those who are with Christ are faithful. This is like the result of being chosen and called. It's being faithful to the Lord. And those who are with Christ are those who have remained by his side regardless of circumstances and sufferings that have come along with being by his side or being because they've been with Christ. They are soldiers that never abandon their stations. 
The passage by no means refers to those who believed for a while. But after a time of temptation fell away. That's not who's being talked about here. This refers to saints who have never forsaken the right way and stayed with Christ to the very end. Remember, we're talking about what Christ is going to present to the Father in the end. That's what he's going to present. Faithful servants. Amen. Now with this being mentioned, I can't help but wonder how so many believers miss this point when they speak about a believer's security. Now don't get me wrong. There is security in Christ. We don't deny this at all. But it is not promised to those who sin willfully after receiving a knowledge of the truth. I'm sorry, it's not. Don't be telling people you're one of the elect if you're not living holy before God. Don't do it. Don't even speak about it. God says he has no pleasure in those who draw back. That's what he said. So many teach that we're locked in and saved regardless of what we do after that initial entrance into the fold. Okay, I believe the first time I was baptized, and then after that, nothing can really undo that. And men may think that they can live in sin, that God will save them based on a past profession. They believe that God will punish them or chastise them for sinning, but ultimately it won't affect that end entrance into the kingdom. What a terrible teaching. The fact is, this is not the kind of people Jesus produces. By I mean, I mean sloppy people who don't follow, who don't listen, who don't do what God says, or they don't do it well. That's not what Jesus produces. Amen. Those who are with Christ are faithful. Now, with that in mind, how innocent is it that professed believers of our time are so lazy and spineless when it comes to the things of God? They don't exert themselves to the Lord. They drop out of the race so easily, afraid to speak about the truth to others. Is it really right that more and more professed Christians are demanding shorter church services and demanding more entertainment? Is that really right? How justifiable is it that heathens who serve false gods, idols, pieces of wood and stone, have more dedication to their work and more zeal to their idols than modern church members are for the Lord. I mean, you see, you see these other people, they, they, they don't teach the truth, they're deceived, but they're more zealous than what you see in the church. Or how about the modern views of believers, you know, like people who have hurts, habits, and hang-ups, and trying to do what's right but failing to do so. Like, that's what Jesus is going to present to the Father. That would be an absolute slap in the face. This cannot be so. God would not be pleased with that. God would not be happy with such a result. These are not the kind of people Jesus produces. Jesus produces faithful followers, not lazy ones. Now allow me to show you what Jesus said about his sheep. This is what Jesus says about his sheep. And if you're going to say you're one of the sheep, you'd best match this description. He says of his sheep, A stranger will they not follow, but they flee from him. They will not, they know not the voice of strangers. That's what Jesus says about his sheep. Later in that chapter, it's in John chapter 10. He says, my sheep, they hear my voice. Here, that's like a capacity. Like when he speaks, they can pick up on it. They know it's him. And he says, I know them, and they follow me. That's like call, you know, they've went after him. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Now see, that's what Jesus says about his sheep. These are the kind of people that are said to be called and chosen that are with Christ. That's who's being described in those verses. Yet today we have people claiming to be accepted by Christ, but they're not following him. They are following, but it's not him. They're following the voice of another. Yes. But Jesus said, my sheep don't follow the voice of another. Amen. It says it right there. You've got to line up with what the scripture says. Otherwise, what you say means nothing. It's amazing how many have been deceived and thinking they can live sloppy and get to heaven. But the fact is, in the end, those who have been chosen by the Lord will have made their election evident by their faithfulness to Christ. Amen. That's going to be like the result. Well how, do you know you, well, how, well, how do you know the elect? Well, in the end, you'll know because they never forsook the right way. That's one way that you will know. And why is it that these people that are with Christ are faithful? Why are they faithful to Christ? Here's some things I can list off. First of all, they are faithful to him because they've remained with him. Jesus didn't say, abide, he did say, abide with me for a reason. They've remained connected to the true vine and didn't cease to bring forth fruit to their master. As long as that connection to Christ exists, there's safety from harm and judgment. 
So the fact that they're faithful means they never cease to bring forth that fruit. They never had to be broken off and cast away. They were doing what they were intended to do. They did what their master told them. Second, they had their affections set on things above, and they ran to obtain the prize. They did not look at the temporal, but at the eternal things, and they laid aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets. Because they had their focus on God, they were not overcome by the world, and they had no trouble hating and despising the things that were in it. Third, they fought for what they had. They resisted the devil, and when he came, when he came at them, they wore the whole armor of God and fought the good fight of faith. They did not fight as one who beats the air, but kept under their bodies and kept them in subjection. They walked circumspectly and did not walk as fools, but as wise. They held fast to what they had till the Lord Jesus came, and stood fast in the liberty wherewith Christ made them free. They did not entangle themselves with the affairs of this life, but endured hardness as good soldiers of Christ. You see, this is also credited to God also. <laughs> that's the thing. Yeah, like the election, that's, that's God. That's not you. That's God. God chose you. The call, that's not you. That's God. God calls you. Faithfulness, that's God too. Amen. So yeah, all three, you don't take credit of any, all three of these. God makes, God makes you faithful by nature. It says God's able to keep you from falling. Well, see, that's part of the, that's part of the thing. You're faithful because God keeps you in a state where you're not going to depart. He keeps you sensitive able to respond, keeps you from growing hard, keeps you from being deceived, keeps you from being led astray, keeps you from being overcome by your enemies when in battle. God does this. This is not things you do on your own mean. Also, God's changed you into a new creature. So by nature, you're faithful due to something God did in you. Because God has, because you've been born again, because that God has raised you to walk in newness of life, because of that, the result is faithfulness to Christ because you're like Christ in nature. You're becoming more like him as you live and grow in the faith. Because eventually you will be you will be like him because you'll see him as he is when he comes. You're being conformed to his image now. So as you share that same kind of nature, you love the things that Christ loves, you hate the things that he hates, you feel, you think the way that he does, you become partakers of his sufferings, partakers of his resurrection, you become partaker, you become joint heirs with him. Join, join heirs with Christ. You become partakers of the inheritance and future glory that he will have. See, when you like, think about all that you're becoming as you're, as you're a believer, faithfulness is like the fruit of that. You're not going to go back to things that were debased and vile. Like, what fruit had you had in those things which of you were now ashamed? Like, you're ashamed of those things now. You don't want to go back. Well, like, well, let's just say it the way Paul said. I am what I am by the grace of God. You <laughs> see, if I'm, a, am I, if I'm a faithful servant, then it's because God made me a faithful servant. I mean, those faithful servants did come to the master. They said, well, look at what I produced. I mean, you'll be able to say this too. You'll be able to say, look at what I produced. But you'll find you were able to produce it because of something God enabled you to do. There will be no unfaithful servants in heaven. So, having gone over all of this, the question I then have for you is, did I just describe you? Are you living holy for the Lord and staying with Christ? When the scriptures speak about the saints of God, do you match those descriptions? So I exhort you to look into these things and see if you are in fact in the faith. Don't assume it. Know it. Make your calling election sure. Never assume that you're free and clear from harm. The devil would love to make you think you're safe when really you're not. Examine yourselves. See if you are, in fact, in Christ and saved from the wrath to come. So that's the description of those in Christ. Called, chosen, faithful. I strongly desire to be presented to God and be shown to be all of those things. Amen. <laughs>